All right, hello everyone. I'm Emily Goulet, Granite State Ambassadors, and we are very excited to be talking to Jeff Rapsis today, who is the Executive Director of the Aviation Museum. So welcome, Jeff. Thank you so much for being with us today. And why don't you start by telling us a little bit about yourself and your journey leading up to becoming the Executive Director of the museum. Sure, uh, well, first, thanks to Granite State Ambassadors uh, for allowing me a chance to talk a little bit about what we do here. And it's nice to see you, Emily, and nice to see everyone who's tuning in uh, today. Um, so uh, a little bit about, um, I guess, about me to start with. I'm a native New Hampshireite, uh, Nashua High School, class of 1982. Um, I went around, saw some of the world, but wound up back here in New Hampshire. Worked in the newspaper business for about 35 years, actually. Um, if you can name a newspaper in New Hampshire, I probably worked there and wore out my welcome there at some point. <laughs> And so that means I worked for almost all of them. Um, and then about 20 years ago, myself and two partners started um, uh, a publication of our own called Hippo Press, based in Manchester. And it's um, turned out to be um, a great resource for what to do and where to go all around New Hampshire. Um, and so that sort of was the first big move toward doing what the Grant State Ambassadors do, which is to make people feel welcome in New Hampshire and, and point out all the things there are to do uh, in this area all year round. Um, uh, a little bit later, uh, I felt um, it was time for me to, to get more seriously into the nonprofit uh, area. I had served on some boards and had worked with some great organizations, but I was fortunate to be in a position where I could um, sort of commit myself professionally uh, to that. Um, and so a few years ago, I took the job as director of the Aviation Museum, which is a nonprofit um, historical and educational organization uh, based here at the Manchester Boston Regional Airport, um, right in Manchester, New Hampshire. So that's a little bit about me. I'm currently a resident of Bedford, New Hampshire, uh, and uh, uh, no kids, two dogs. <laughs> um, and uh, on, uh, on non-working times, I am a um, silent film accompanist where I go around and do live music for performances of silent films at theaters in New Hampshire and also around New England and sometimes all around the world. So that's a little bit about me. Well, that is very cool. I also play the pianist. I'm from pianist to pianist. I can appreciate that. Very neat. Oh, great. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about the Aviation Museum. When does it open? What's your typical schedule? What's What can we expect to see there? Sure. Uh, well, I think the first thing to note is that the Aviation Museum is, is not like the um, uh, Museum of Fine Arts in Boston or even the Courier here in, in Manchester. We're a smaller nonprofit. Uh, and we operate um, as an educational center as well as a museum. So a lot of our activities are uh, sort of off our museum property and in schools where we do outreach and work with students. And I think we'll talk about that a little bit more later on. Uh, for the public though, um, our museum is housed in a very interesting building. It's the original 1937 airline terminal that was built here in the Great Depression when it, commercial aviation was in its infancy. Uh, and Manchester was just getting its first passenger flights at that time. And the, the, um, under the federal government, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt's um, WPA, the Works Progress Administration, was um, giving buildings to communities like post offices and city halls. And they would also build an airline terminal if you needed one. Manchester got its own airline terminal in 1937. Very small building with a little glass tower on it. Um, and it was only used as a terminal for a short time until uh, the, I think 1941 or 42, so just a few years, when the whole field got turned into a military air base during World War II. Um, and so the terminal sort of got set aside and wasn't used for many years. Uh, it uh, was finally gonna be torn down um, in the year 2004, um, but there were some people in Manchester who felt it would be a shame to lose this wonderful old historic structure. It had to be moved because it was in the way of a runway expansion. So we did pick it up and move it about a mile and a half from one side of the field to the other, put it on a new foundation, and it became the Aviation Museum of New Hampshire. Uh, and we've since added a learning center um, to the, the, uh, the back of it uh, that greatly expanded our exhibit space. Um, and so uh, we're open to the public now um, three days a week, year round, uh, Fridays and Saturdays, 10 to four, Sundays one to four. Um, right now, because of the, the COVID-19 situation, 
we've reduced our hours a little bit because of different reasons that require us to do extra cleaning and we need more manpower um, to, to staff the museum. So our hours are sort of shifting around. So I encourage people to check online for the latest updates, either on our website, which is aviationmuseumofnh.org or on Facebook, if you just go to Facebook and, and search for the Aviation Museum of New Hampshire, we keep things updated there as well. Um, so if people do come to visit us, they'll find, I think, uh, a real um, grab bag of all kinds of great uh, exhibits that tell all of the fascinating stories of the early days of Grant State Aviation and some not so early days stories as well that we've collected here at the museum. Uh, we also have an archive and a library with over 3000 items that we've collected uh, to preserve all these great stories uh, and all of the um, materials and things that have come to us over the years the museum's been um, in business. The museum um, opened in 2004. Um, before that, there was a group called the New Hampshire Aviation Historical Society that actively collected materials and uh, from uh, vintage aircraft and so on. And, and we sort of descended from that. So it, it's still our parent organization, the New Hampshire Aviation Historical Society is our actual legal name, doing business as the Aviation Museum of New Hampshire. Excellent. Thank you so much. So tell us about some of the upcoming projects that you're working on. Well, uh, a lot of our uh, efforts, as I mentioned earlier, are um, about education because our, our mission is two parts, to preserve the past of New Hampshire and, and New England aviation, but it's also to help inspire young people to um, think of aviation and aerospace as a really uh, good career move to, to make, uh, to inspire them to consider aviation as something they could um, to make a great life out of. Um, and so because of that, we, we do uh, spend a lot of time and effort on educational outreach programs um, that um, go out into the schools and work with kids in public schools and in home schools and in private schools as well um, to carry out that mission. So right now, the, the, the biggest thing we're doing um, is a high school program that we've done in partnership with one of the local high schools right in Manchester. Uh, and we have a team of students who's actually building an airplane. <laughs> um, you know, you have to ask yourself, high school students building a plane, what could go wrong? Um, but it turns out it's actually uh, a program. We're only the fourth program in the nation that's doing this type of project where we take a plane that is designed to be built by someone in their own home. It's a home built plane. There's a whole market for this for people, you know, people who like to work with their hands and they, if they want to try assembling a plane, Usually it's pilots and other people who are in aviation. Uh, it turns out that is a great educational um, uh, project as well for kids. And of course, kids in high school may not, they, they're not gonna have pilots licenses or anything, but what a great opportunity for kids in uh, engineering and manufacturing programs like we have here in Manchester to take their uh, knowledge out of the classroom and put it into the workshop where uh, they spend uh, four days a week with hands-on experience working with a team of mentors from our museum, volunteers, people who've had experience in all the different crafts of aviation are there to kind of help them along. Um, so that's been uh, a really um, uh, special initiative that we've done in partnership with the Manchester School of Technology here in Manchester and with an educational consultant nonprofit from Texas, which sort of started this whole program called Tango Flight. Uh, and the first plane is still under construction when it is finished and certified uh, as flyable, uh, it will be sold. And the proceeds from that plane will be used to buy the next kit so the next group of students can build their plane. So it becomes this self-sustaining program that gives kids a chance to do something that really augments what they learn in the classroom uh, and yet doesn't cost taxpayers an extra dime. It's all self-funding. So there's a lot of, there's like a, a lot of winners in this, and we're very proud of that particular initiative. Uh, we also do programs for kids at other age levels. Um, we, this past year, uh, because of COVID-19, we could not do our traditional outreach, which means going into classrooms uh, and talking about aviation and all the related topics. Uh, and there's an emphasis on the science, of course, when we go in there, because the physics of flight and some of the things you need to know build really nicely off of the kind of STEM education that kids are getting in middle schools these days. Um, so we couldn't do that. So instead we created an online program using our flight simulator, which we have here at the Aviation Museum, 
we were able to create a video-based program um, that uh, allowed, that was a kind of a journey around the world, starting from Manchester. We flew all the way around the globe in stages and encouraged students to kind of tune in as we made our way around the globe, all the way from Manchester um, east towards Europe and then through Africa into Asia, across the Pacific and back. It took about three months, um, but it was a wonderful adventure that we felt we could keep doing this even after COVID-19 has passed. What a great way for us to carry our mission out to other places beyond the immediate Manchester area, all across the state and perhaps even further afield. We may have invented kind of a new thing thanks to COVID-19. So that's a little bit about our educational um, projects that we have going on that are a big part of what the Aviation Museum does. Absolutely, that's so many interactive projects as well, which I think makes it even more exciting. And you've talked about your, your partnerships with schools and uh, education especially. Do you have any other local businesses that you partner with? Well, as a nonprofit in New Hampshire, um, we, we don't receive any kind of government funding. We don't receive any um, guaranteed funding. We have to earn every dollar that we have, either through memberships or through admission fees. But the biggest source of funding for us is local business. Um, and that comes in many different uh, forms. Uh, for the high school plane build, uh, we actually were um, fortunate to have access to a funding vehicle called uh, tax credits that are administered by the Community Development Finance Authority here in New Hampshire. And it's one of the options the state makes available for businesses to support um, nonprofits or charitable causes by purchasing tax credits against their business profits taxes. And we were fortunate to receive um, a, an allotment of those to support the, the plane building program to buy that first kit so that the kids could build the plane. Um, and so several businesses uh, here in the Manchester area uh, were very generous in stepping up to support the purchase of those tax credits. Um, it was the Wirebelt Company in Londonderry, which is actually right here at the airport and part of our sort of neighborhood. Uh, it was the um, Auto Fair uh, family of dealerships right here in Manchester. Uh, we had the uh, Anagnost Properties and Investments. Dick Anagnost uh, was a supporter of this project. Um, we had uh, a company called Macy Industries, which is uh, it's not a high profile company, but they're a sheet metal company um, and they do amazing um, industrial um, manufacturing and hooks it. And they've been part of our community for a long time and they supported it. And the Brady Sullivan Properties also purchased tax credits. So th those are some of the businesses that have supported uh, that initiative. Um, and you can see it ranges from manufacturing companies to property management companies. And the, the reason I think people supported it from so many different ways is because uh, if the Manchester school system isn't top notch, it affects so many things about this community. And when we can put a program in the schools where kids are actually building an airplane, that really stands out. And I think it helps the whole community. Even if you don't have kids in the school, uh, the um, the, the uh, program helps Manchester's profile uh, in so many ways that we all benefit from it. Um, so uh, the business community has been really important in keeping our uh, museum able to keep our mission um, you know, going forward uh, and reaching a, a lot of kids about science and uh, math and some of the topics that uh, kids really need to be focusing on these days. And we try to give them a reason uh, to do that by bringing aviation into the classrooms and aerospace. When, when young kids come into the museum, we have a mural in the front lobby where we've painted the images of all of the pioneers of New Hampshire aviation. And, and that includes people like Alan Shepard, the astronaut who made the first American space flight in 1961. He was from Derry, New Hampshire. He also walked on the moon in 1971 and shot a golf ball too um, in Apollo 14. So we have his picture there. And we have Kristen McAuliffe's picture there. We have other people. But then we tell the kids, you'll notice there's a lot of blue sky in between these people. And the reason for that is because we wanted to save room to paint your picture there someday when you make your contributions to aviation, um, provided you get the bug now and start studying hard. That's great. That's so cute. <laughs> and as a fellow nonprofit, we understand the need for uh, different, different programs and different partnerships with uh, all sorts of businesses. And so, as you know, our part of what we do is our Granite State ambassadors are around the state referring 
different locations to our visitors. And so what do you think are some of the top reasons that Granite State ambassadors should be referring the Aviation Museum to our guests? Well, I think um, uh, we've sort of, um, sort of taken our cue from the Granite State ambassadors. Um, Granite State ambassadors, um, the way I see it is it's all about making a human connection to visitors who are here, you know, it's one thing to read a brochure. You know, we can, people can look at this brochure about the Aviation Museum and that's great. It gives you the information. It says when it's open, but, oh, is it so much different when you can have a person talking with somebody and making them feel welcome. So our Aviation Museum uh, is a museum, but the model we have is uh, we operate under a model where volunteer um, guides and docents are part of our family and whenever we're open, uh, when visitors come, they meet with a docent or a volunteer who is trained uh, and, and knows about all of the exhibits, um, but is also a human being who wants to hear the stories from the people who come to us, wants to answer their question, wants to make them feel welcome. So that's all part of the experience of visiting the Aviation Museum in New Hampshire. There are many museums that have uh, antique planes and other memorabilia from the early days of aviation. But I think one of the things that sets us apart, even though we're not the largest museum, is that we have kind of the biggest heart. Uh, we have people who love aviation and love talking about it and love communicating about it, teaching people or learning from others who come to us with amazing backgrounds. You never know who's going to walk through the door here. Um, and that's part of the fun, I think, and what makes us special and, and worth visiting. Even if you're not a big fan of aviation. Um, we do have a nice gift store. People can come and browse if they, <laughs> they want to do that as well. So there's something for everyone. Um, and I think especially young people, uh, kids, uh, get a lot out of our museum. Uh, the museum itself is interesting, but our location is also a really important part of uh, why I think we're worth visiting because we are right next to runway 1735 at Manchester Boston Regional Airport. And this is the main runway at the airport. Uh, you cannot get any closer to this runway uh, without hopping over the fence. Uh, and so it's a tremendous viewing spot for people to see action on the airfield in a safe environment in our parking lot, which is kind of like a park almost. Uh, we have some picnic tables in the summertime and, and soon we'll be linked to the Londonderry Rail Trail. We used to have a railroad line going through the airport that went right next to where our museum is. And so when the Londonderry Rail Trail is extended um, a bit further, it'll reach our parking lot and will become a sort of a gathering place for people uh, right next to the runway with all kinds of planes coming and going. And there's always something to look at. Um, and uh, I have to say that uh, if what we have in the museum doesn't inspire a young person, we take them outside to the runway because that's our best exhibit. Um, and if, if nothing else works, that usually does when you can see a Southwest 737 rotating on takeoff you know, just a football throw away outside our front window here. It really is something. So it, it's worth coming to see us for all those reasons. Absolutely. And it, and it makes that in-person experience even worth even more. And so unfortunately, right now, as you know, in, in our times of COVID, it, it, these in-person experiences are few and far in between. Um, what are some of the virtual opportunities that you have available right now for someone who is waiting for uh, a little bit safer time to be visiting the museum? Well, uh, the main um, project that we put some effort into um, after the COVID-19 situation uh, sort of set in uh, was our project to um, reach uh, children and students and teachers um, so that we could continue our education outreach uh, online instead of in person. Um, and it was intended as an educational project, as I said, for students and teachers, but it turned out to be of interest to, I guess you could say children of all ages, because we know that from the data that uh, we had people tuning into this from all regions of the country, all around the world, actually, um, and from all different backgrounds, because it was an entertaining adventure. And as it unfolded, uh, more and more people were finding it. So. Um, if you go to our website, which is aviationmuseumofnh.org, and you click on the Around the World Flight Adventure, you'll see it there. You can relive this flight that was um, 24 or 26 segments that took us all around the world. And each segment is a web page that has about 10 to 20 minutes of, of video that was made using the 
cockpit simulator. Um, and we have all kinds of information about what you're flying over, whether it's the Eiffel Tower or the Taj Mahal. It's a way to travel that we can use our aviation museum around the world flight to go anywhere you want, even at a time when we're all kind of stuck at home and trying to keep our distance and not having an opportunity to travel. You know, at this point, uh, the, when we're recording this, uh, Americans actually can't go to so many countries around the world because of the COVID-19 situation. Well, with the Aviation Museum's online around the world flight adventure, uh, you can, even though it's a virtual experience, uh, it, it's possible to do this. And I have to say, I learned a lot about places that we went and the cultures and the people. And we even made a point of trying to identify common snack foods in every place that we went <laughs> to just keep it interesting and make it real for people as if you really were traveling there. Well, that sounds like a lot of fun. I'll have to check that out. Okay. So obviously this is uh, not a normal year, but in a standard typical year, do you have any uh, annual events that, that you offer for people to visit? Yes, we do. Um, we, um, we actually uh, make a point of trying to always have a full calendar of things to get people to come to the airport and to our museum. Uh, to carry out our mission. Um, and a lot of the events are sort of um, aimed at both parts of our mission. We want to celebrate the history of flight, but we also want to inspire young people to make their own mark, you know, in the years to come. So uh, the events calendar um, is a pretty busy place uh, year round. It's been a little quiet because of COVID-19. We're not allowed to use our museum as a theater or a lecture hall just right now. But typically every month we'd have some attraction either on a weeknight or on the weekend uh, to get a crowd in and to do an event. Uh, the big events that we do each year, um, there are four of them that we um, have managed to keep going through even the COVID-19 era. Um, and they are uh, in July, we actually do an antique and uh, classic car show on our grounds here at the airport. Now I know we're an aviation museum, why a car show? Um, it turns out that a lot of folks that enjoy aviation have an affinity also for uh, cars and sometimes antique cars. And um, it turned out to be a really uh, strong event for us, um, especially this year during COVID-19 when a lot of the other car shows didn't take place. Uh, and we were fortunate we have a large open area out here uh, as part of our grounds. And so we had over 250 vehicles come this past July for a, just a, a wonderful show that showed automotive uh, developments um, from 100 years ago all the way till now. Um, so that's every July we do an auto show. Um, in um, August, we do something called Plane Fest, and that's sort of a county fair with airplanes. We um, try to bring in vintage aircraft um, so that people can see them up close and personal. Uh, we try to bring in specialty aircraft so that people can see those. Um, we usually offer a Young Eagles program where people aged 8 to 18 I'm sorry, eight to 17 can um, get free rides in planes from local pilots to give themselves that experience. Uh, and we do a lot of other things that day too. So it's basically an all day sort of um, festival uh, about aviation. And that's in August every year. Uh, in September, we have an annual gala, which is our main fundraising event uh, of the year. But it's also a great time to get together and meet people and hear from uh, people that we bring in. Uh, sometimes uh, celebrities come in to talk a little bit about aviation and what they've done and what they've contributed to it. So uh, our last one, we did not do one this year because of COVID-19, we're not able to put one together under all the conditions that we had. Uh, but the year before that, our special guest was the guy, uh, you may not know his name, it's Richard Van Grunsven, uh, but he's famous in the aviation world because he started a company called Vans Aircraft uh, and th this is a company that builds those kits that we have that the kids are putting together at the Manchester uh, School of Technology. Uh, and he's still around. He, you know, he's retired now, but he's in his 80s. And he loves talking about how he designed the planes for people to build them. And uh, he's highly regarded in the aviation world. And we had him as a guest at the last one uh, via Skype because he wasn't able to travel from Oregon where he lives but we had the kids from the high school there and they could talk to him via Skype. And it was as close as we could get to having the Wright brothers, you know, in the room so that these kids could talk with someone whose name was on the plane. I mean, when they're building a Vans RV-12, he's the van, Richard Van Grunsven. So uh, 
And then uh, the uh, final one of the big four uh, is our annual, um, uh, we call it a holiday festival of toy planes. Um, we have possession of a, a special collection of about 3,500 toy aircraft that we inherited from another museum in Massachusetts. And we have our own models and so on. Uh, and for um, the holidays, uh, we put it all out on the floor in a kind of a Christmas holiday wonderland. Uh, we also bring Santa Claus in on a helicopter on one Saturday prior to Christmas. And we will do that again this year. It'll have to all be outside and probably in a tent rather than have Santa come into the museum and talk with the kids. Um, but we have that ready to go as well after Thanksgiving. We'll turn our whole museum into kind of an aviation winter wonderland. Um, and it seems pretty popular, especially around Christmas break and after New Year's when people um, have time to come and, and enjoy what we've created. So we are uh, already got that in the works for uh, the next holiday cycle coming up. Um, so those are the big four. Excellent. Well, that sounds like a lot of different uh, opportunities for people. I'm glad that you've been able to continue with some of them even during this crazy year. Yeah. So thank you so much for providing all of this information. Is there anything else that we should know about the Aviation Museum that you'd like to share? Well, our main, um, I think our main um, issue is that we're not on a, a big road anywhere. We're actually, you know, we're on the airfield at Manchester Boston Regional Airport. So we're very visible if you're landing in a plane. <laughs> but for like a busy road, we're not on a busy road. And so people don't see us, I think as often as they see some other attractions like the Anheuser-Busch Brewery, you can't miss that, you know, um, or the State House in Concord. It's right there. It's got a big golden dome on it. But we're sort of tucked away on one side of what is really an industrial park. You have to know where we are to find us. And so I would encourage people to, if they, if they may have been here in New Hampshire as long as I have, and they may be surprised to hear that New Hampshire has an aviation museum. Well, we do. And it really is worth seeking out. Um, and the one thing that people can do is when you're around the mall of New Hampshire in the Manchester area, on South Willow Street, there are those brown signs that say Aviation Museum, you know, that a lot of the cultural attractions have. And if you follow those, you cannot miss us. You're gonna make some twists and turns, but you'll find us. Uh, and I hope that encourages you to join in with what we do. Uh, we're open to anybody. And we especially um, uh, are looking for volunteers uh, to build up our core of volunteers that we have um, to do all the things I've been describing. And you do not have to have a background in aviation. Uh, you do not have to have, uh, you don't have to have a pilot's license or anything like that. Uh, the only qualification I say for anyone to really come here and want to make a contribution is uh, if you hear some really loud noise of something coming in on the field and you look to see what it is, then you're one of us. <laughs> you belong and you should be part of the Aviation Museum of New Hampshire because every volunteer here, we have something for everybody and everybody makes a contribution. And without our volunteers, uh, I don't know where we'd be. So it's, it's a big uh, opportunity for people to make a big difference if they'd like to by checking us out. Great, well, thank you so much, Jeff, for taking the time to speak with us and sharing uh, your wealth of knowledge about aviation and about your museum. And uh, we look forward to sharing this information with both our GSAs and the industry and visitors to the state of New Hampshire. So thank you. Well, Emily, thank you and everybody at Grand State Ambassadors for the year round action um, that goes on with you welcoming people, spring, summer, winter, fall. The Grand State Ambassadors really put a nice human face on um, New Hampshire's uh, act, uh, activities and attractions. Um, and uh, so uh, congratulations on all the success that you've had and Let's hope for continued success for uh, everybody uh, in the years to come. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Okay, Emily, thank you.